Let's all stand and worship together. I don't always 
always understand I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will believe it That you make a
hold on a minute, folks, and we just want to pray for Amy right at the moment. She's not well. Lord, we just lift Amy up to you. We pray your healing touch upon her body right now. Pray that you just strengthen her, God. Lord, we thank you for her ministry to us. We minister to her right now as we lift her up in prayer in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless you. She'll be okay there. You may be seated. Great to be together in worship this morning here at, uh, at the church. And if you're joining us online, it's lovely to have you with us also. And uh, we believe that God wants to do a great work in your heart, whoever you are today. Here in the room or with us online, God wants to do something very, very special for you today. And uh, we're going to come to the Lord's table and we're just going to worship uh, as, we, as we do this, we've been singing a song about hope that we have that is an anchor for our soul, right? Let me read to you where we find that in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6. And uh, the writer to the Hebrews has been talking about people who turn back and don't progress on in their faith. He said, but we are confident of better things of you. Why? Because they were harder triers? Because they were better workers? No, because the writer of the Hebrews knew these people and he knew that they had been truly born again. And here's the thing, if you're truly born again, it's not you holding on to God, it's God holding on to you. And so the writer of the Hebrews says, we know you're not going to turn back. And the reason we know it is because we've seen the genuine evidence of faith in your life. And then he says, because... When God made a promise to Abraham, he could swear by no greater, so he swore by himself. So he goes back thousands of years to bring out this illustration, and he says, you know what, when God entered into covenant with Abraham, what men tend to do is they say, you know, I, I swear on my mother's life. I swear on my children. Religious people, might even go as far, so far as to say, I swear on the Bible. The Jews like to say, I swear on the holy temple. Always looking for something greater, something that we prize more, that we can, we can use as our way of getting across to you. We really mean this. But God could not reach up and find anything higher than himself. And he said, here's the promise I make. It's not based on the temple or any other thing. It's based on me and my character and my nature. I make a promise to you, Abraham. I will never let you go. I'm in this covenant forever. And so here we come and the writer of the Hebrews is saying, we know that you're born again and God has made a covenant with you through Jesus Christ. He has sworn by his own name, he will never let you go. And so Jesus can now be called the author and the finisher of our faith. He started us in this Christian walk He's going to complete us in this Christian walk. He carries us every step of the way. I have a warning for you folks today. If you became a Christian one day by coming to the altar and giving your life to Christ, and you thought, well, I had to cast all of my trust on Jesus at that moment, but now I'm kind of getting along myself, you've missed the way. Everything in our lives from beginning to end as believers is done trusting in Jesus Christ. He's the one who started us. He must carry us. He will finish us in this marvelous salvation that he's given to us. Amen. But he's going to do it. And he's promised on his own name. God in the heavens will perish before this promise fails. That if Jesus Christ has saved you, then you are saved indeed. Hallelujah. Isn't that marvelous? Now you're holding in your hands little symbols, earthly symbols of an eternal covenant a piece of bread or wafer and some grape juice, the fruit of the vine that speak of Jesus' body that was broken so harshly for us, his blood that was shed for us. God himself provided the way. We've come on God's terms according to his promises and they cannot fail. So I want you to stand with me again this morning in God's presence and just take that cup and that wafer Open it up and, and just hold the wafer in your hand. Prepare to drink the cup with us. 
And let us just pause and open our hearts up to God and thank Him for so great a salvation that's not based upon our works. Because if our salvation is based on our works in any way, we're finished. We cannot maintain our works. But if it's based on the work that Jesus done, it is accomplished. It is done forever. Thank God for that. Let's just look into our hearts this morning and do what Jesus told us to do. Examine ourselves. Are we coming to this table completely trusting in Jesus Christ and no other? Have we abandoned every other hope of salvation? Are we coming to Him and daily confessing our sins that we might know that He has forgiven them all by the power of His endless atoning blood? Are we living for His glory and for His honor? It's the only way for a Christian to live. Let's just look into our hearts this morning and worship Him and prepare to receive these emblems. Precious Savior, still our refuge. We thank you that each and every day we are sustained, we are carried, we are strengthened by Jesus and his power alive in us. And the entire pathway was purchased by the price paid upon the cross. Lord, this morning, we worship you again as our only hope, our only Savior, our living God. We give you the praise and the glory. Our sins are forgiven because of what you did. We walk in the power of the Holy Spirit whom you gave, and we bless your wonderful name. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. He tore it, just as Abraham tore those pieces of the animals before God's presence when covenant was being made. He tore them in half and put them out on the ground. Jesus tore the bread and said, my own body is going to become the covenant that God will never renege on. If you're trusting in me, you will be saved. Let's eat together the bread that Jesus gave to us to eat. same way after supper he took the cup he said this blood is poured out for you there's salvation there's clean cleansing there's healing there's victory there's everything that you need in the in the price that Jesus paid let us drink together and as we do the Bible says that we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes let's drink together Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lift up your voice and thank him together this morning. We love you, Lord. We praise your wonderful name, beautiful name, holy name. We thank you for all that you've done for us. Hallelujah. Your name is higher. Your power is greater. All our hope is in you. Bless your wonderful name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Are you glad you're saved this morning? Are you glad for what Jesus did for you? Praise His wonderful name. Come on, let's praise Him together today. Bless Him. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Amen. You may be seated. And uh, just very quickly, let me bring you some announcements. And the first one is this, that we are thankful to you for all the ways that you give and uh, how you support the work here at Brookfield First and around the world through our missions program. And uh, we invite you to prepare yourself to give again this morning. There are several ways that you can do that. Uh, you can fill out uh, your check or put your money in the envelope that's in the seat in front of you. Take it to the baskets at the doors on the way out and just drop those in there. Or uh, this is especially helpful for those who are at home as well, but anybody can do this. Go to our website, brookfieldfirst.org, 
and the giving tab, just click on there and you can give your gift that way. You can set up recurring giving. Uh, you can give by texting. You text the word B first, B F I R S T, send it to the number 73256. And you will immediately get a response, and that will take you into our giving portal. Or you can just mail a check to the church, and, uh, and that's an easy way. Uh, send it to the church office. So God bless you as you give this morning, and God will use your giving. Uh, a couple of quick notices. The first one is that there is a VBS volunteer workshop today. So if you're helping with VBS this summer, uh, that's coming right up. Uh, we, we need you to join in with all the volunteers for a little bit of training today. It's a workshop immediately after church, and I believe it's downstairs, Pastor Jim. So if you go down to the, to the youth room, then you'll be, able to, um, you'll be able to join in with that workshop. And also, women's ministry. Our women's ministry is rolling out a new initiative we heard about last week called Life on Life. Uh, if you would like to... Uh, be assigned a mentor as a woman in our church, or if you'd like to be a, a mentor to somebody else, you can speak to Sandra Nunez. She'll be out in the foyer uh, this week and next week after church. All right. Shall we worship some more just before we come to God's word? Let's all stand together and praise him. Yeah. Hey. 
be seated. Praise God. Well, just to give you a little update, Amy was uh, really dizzy there and, and had to be helped, but I understand she's fine. She's going to be okay. So thank God for that. Just keep her in your prayers. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Open up your Bible with me, if you would, to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 10, as we continue our series this morning, working through the Gospel of Mark. We've, uh, we've called this series Dividing Line, and uh, we're well into this book, up to chapter 10 of Mark now. But if this is your first time at Brookfield First, or the first time tuning in online, it's perfectly okay. I think you'll understand everything as we go through this morning with this teaching. Um, you can always go back and, and watch the entire series. It's on our YouTube channel, and you could, uh, you could catch up with all of the videos there. But we're in Mark chapter 10, and we're going to be reading from verse 23. Just before I read uh, the passage this morning, I want to just mention an infamous expedition to the Arctic Circle that took place in 1845. It was called the Franklin Expedition, and uh, it was actually a turning point in Arctic exploration because it was such a well-publicized failure. And they learned a lot from that expedition, and those who went later didn't at all act the way that this expedition did as they tried to reach the North Pole and to explore the Arctic. You see, the preparations that this group made to go to the Arctic were more suitable for the Royal Navy Officers Club in London than for the conditions that they were going to meet in the frigid Arctic Circle. The explorers made room on their ships so that they could bring with them a large library, a hand organ, uh, China place settings, and cut glass wine goblets. They were going to have a good time on their trip to the Arctic Circle. They had sterling silver flatware instead of bringing additional coal for their steam engines. The ornate silver flatware was engraved with each individual officer's initials and family crest. You cannot complain that they didn't prepare. They just prepared with things that really didn't matter when it came to exploring the Arctic. Search parties found clumps of bodies of men who had set off to walk for help when their supplies ran out. One skeleton that they found was wearing his fine blue cloth uniform, edged with silk braid. Can't imagine anything less suitable for the bitter Arctic cold, but he looked nice. Another apparently chose when he left the ship to carry with him his place setting of silver flatware. You cannot imagine that any of these sailor adventurers would have said as they neared death on the frozen landscape, I wish I'd brought more of those silver place settings with me. Our hanging on to things in this life that are ultimately useless is going to look no less foolish when we step into eternity. Many people cannot envision a life without things that they cherish and that they hold on to these days. But they are in danger of losing the only life that really counts. So let's read what Jesus had to say in Mark 10, starting at verse 23. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, 
but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last first. Let's ask the Lord to help us this morning with these well-known words. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have given us everything that we need for life and for godliness. Everything that we need to move from where we were born in this world to your eternal kingdom. And you gave it to us in this book, the Bible. We pray, Lord, you'd come and just open up its secrets to us this morning. Speak by your Holy Spirit so that we understand not just with our minds intellectually, but we understand with our hearts that, Lord, this truth that you've given us possesses us and we live for its promises and by its power in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So our reading this morning begins in verse 23 with the word, then. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, and that links us with the previous passage, doesn't it? It links us with what we were talking about last week. The message title this morning is The Rich Young Ruler, Part 2. Because last week, we were talking about this young man who came to Jesus, a man who, it appeared, was very successful in life. He was wealthy. People looked to him. He seemed to be a very nice person. He came to Jesus and he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus spoke with him, and we, uh, we unpacked all of that last week. What follows is Jesus' response to that young man walking away from Jesus. He turns and he speaks to his disciples and those around, and he says how hard it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, note that the rich young ruler had a great deal of sincerity. When this young man came to Jesus, he was sincere. It says that he came running to Jesus. He wanted to speak to Jesus. He had an urgency about him. It says that he knelt before Jesus. So he was coming with humility. He, he was respectful about the way that he spoke with Jesus. But none of that, no sincerity that you may have in life is ever a replacement for action. It's not a replacement for obeying what God tells you to do. There are a lot of people who would come to God today and they would say, God, tell me what to do with my life. But when he points them back to what his plan is and what his word says, they don't want that way. They want some other way, even if it's a religious way, even if it seems to be a way that the world would endorse. They want any other plan except the plan that God has made. Think about this young man who came to Jesus. He had so much right, didn't he? First of all, he came to the right person. He came to Jesus with his questions about eternal life. He came to the right person. Secondly, he came in the right posture. He didn't come arrogantly. He knelt before Jesus. Thirdly, he asked the right question. Of all the questions he could have asked in life, he asked about eternity. He said, God, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's the right question that we all must answer in life. And fourthly, he got the right answer to his question. Of course he did. You're not going to get any answer but the right answer when you speak to Jesus. So he spoke to the right person. But the right person. He came in the right posture. He asked the right question. He got the right answer. And he still walked away sorrowful. Our last glimpse of this man, so far as we know, is that he was still lost. He had gained nothing. It's tragic, isn't it? 
It's tragic. I don't know about you, but I hope, I hope, I hope that those words of Jesus haunted him. I hope that the Spirit of God continued to work in his heart and we meet him one day in heaven. But we don't know. Belief in Jesus in itself is not enough. The Bible says that even the demons of hell believe in God and they tremble. It's not enough in itself. In the Bible, to trust in Christ, which is the only way of salvation, it's not by our works or anything that we do. It is simply to trust in Christ. It means more than assenting to a a set of ideas. It's, It's more than agreeing to a creed. It means to trust in Christ means to commit your whole life to him. To cast everything upon him in absolute reliance, knowing that even when you cast yourself upon him, you still can't save yourself. The minimum requirement is giving up every other hope and clinging to Jesus. But even that action in itself can't save you. Notice that Jesus let this man walk away. He let the man walk away. We do well to think about that in our evangelistic efforts. Jesus never tried to badger people into the kingdom. Jesus never once compromised on the cost. He never lowered the bar. He said to the man, he said, well, this is the starting point. Give away everything that you have and come and follow me. The man was obviously possessed by his possessions. He he was pursuing his riches as the the center of his life and he couldn't do it. And he walked away sorrowful. Jesus never chased him and said, well, come on, let's talk about this some more. Maybe you can keep a little bit. Maybe maybe we can work something out. You ever been to one of those used car sales lots? And the used car salesman says, this is absolutely the best offer that I can do. I cannot change it until you walk out the door. You walk out the door and you find him, he's chasing you down the pathway. And all of a sudden, the price goes lower. All of a sudden, everything really can change. Jesus is no salesman. You can only come to God on his terms and there's no bargaining ever. We come to God on his terms. And that brings us to the first point that I want to bring out of this passage this morning. If you downloaded the notes, you can fill in the first blank. It's this. Man's problem. Man's problem, as we're going to see in Jesus' words so clearly this morning, man's problem is that salvation is impossible. Salvation is impossible. Read these verses with me again. Verse 23. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It says the disciples were amazed. Actually, if you read the whole passage as we're going to get into it, in verse 22, it says that they were amazed. Uh, Sorry, verse 23. That's verse 24. They were amazed. Verse 26 says they were even more amazed as he kept going. Their amazement went to incredulity. They were absolutely stunned by what Jesus was saying. Why? Why? Because we read back on this passage and we've heard these words many times and to us it's not so stunning. We, we're kind of used to this terminology from Jesus. Why were the disciples so stunned? They've just been with him for months after months of his teaching and then he says this, how hard it is for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God and they're gobsmacked. They're stunned by it. Why? Because you see, in the Jewish culture of that time, Prosperity, wealth, was often seen as a sign of God's blessing. So if you were rich, that didn't mean you were far from God. It probably meant that you were close to God. That's what their religious leaders taught them. 
Of course, most of those religious leaders were pretty wealthy. And they, they taught that, that wealth was a sign of God's prosperity. Where have I heard that before? Don't we have that right through Western Christianity today? Don't we, don't we say that across the airwaves all the time, that this is what Christianity is about? If God blesses you, everything's going to be sweet and rosy. If it's not so sweet and rosy, you're not doing it right. They were as astonished as many American Christians might be to hear Jesus' words. You see, they often made this argument. They said, well, wealth is obviously a sign of God's blessing because, after all, the wealthy can afford to be the biggest donors. They have the most to give. I want you to be very careful of the kind of thinking that says, I want to go and I want to make a lot of money so that I can do more for God. I want to make a lot of money and become very wealthy so that I can do more for the kingdom. Have you ever heard somebody saying that? There are three problems with that as I see it. Number one, it's too easy to be masking your real motivations. And they're less than pure. I'm going to make a lot and, and, and have a lot so that I can do a lot more. Yeah, but really, is that what you want a lot more for? It's too easy to use that to mask your real motivations. Number two, it is based on a faulty premise. It's based on the faulty premise that God somehow needs your money and that he can use rich people more than he can use poor people. That's false. Jesus actually had the temerity to praise the giving of a widow who could only give her last mites. And I'll tell you this, the kingdom is built on the widow's might, upon the sacrifices of God's people, not their giving out of abundance. Thirdly, this thinking that if I, if I can make a lot, then I can do a lot, it has distracted so many people from serving God now. They're always pushing it off into the future somewhere to a tomorrow that never comes. They're never wealthy enough to do something for God. And so they waste their lives pursuing money. So Jesus' pronouncement again is countercultural, and the disciples are shocked. What, what do you mean that it's hard for rich people to enter the kingdom of God? We've always been raised to believe they were close to the kingdom. The rich have several problems to contend with. Usually, they live with a false sense of security in this world. The more you have, the more you trust in. A sense of independence that they can make it on their own because they have enough. And they tend to be bound up with the affairs of this world. So what does Jesus say? He says this incredible metaphor, doesn't he? He says, you know what? It's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. That seems like a strange illustration. Does that mean you pick two very kind of arbitrary things there, a camel and, and a sewing needle. What are you talking about, Jesus? It seems strange, but it's not really strange because think of it this way. A camel was simply the largest beast in Palestine. It was the largest animal that anyone there had ever seen. The largest living thing that people had seen. And the idea was for it to pass through the eye of a needle, which was about the smallest opening that a person could imagine. So he's just taking the biggest creature and the smallest passage, and he's putting them together. Now, some people have tried to explain Jesus' words away, haven't they? Have you ever heard this one? Or well, what Jesus was actually talking about was that there was a gate in Jerusalem. And this gate had a door inside it so they could open the whole gate to let people come in. But in a time when there was a threat of enemies or something, they would just open the little door for more security. And a camel could pass through the gate, but they could never pass through the little door. And that, that little door was called the eye of the needle. 
And see, it's easier for a camel. What would they do if they had to get a camel into the city? They would have to take all the stuff off its back, get it down on its knees and quite push it to the opening and shove it from the back. And it would be a lot of work to get that camel through that little door. That's what he's talking about. It would take a lot. And you know what? We can build sermons out. This will preach. You know, the camel has to get down on his knees. If the rich person wants to come to God, they have to get down on their knees and humble themselves. It preaches really great, doesn't it? Except it's a load of hogwash. It, it's not true. There is a door in a gate in Jerusalem that the locals will take gullible tourists to and say to them, this is the eye of the needle Jesus was talking about. The problem is it only dates back to medieval times. No such gate existed in ancient cities. It's, it's not true. It's a much later idea. But also, the bigger problem is this. It defeats the whole point of what Jesus is saying. Because guess what? You may be able to ram a camel through that door with some effort. Jesus is making the point you'll never get a camel through the eye of a needle. It's not hard. It's impossible. You see, we, we want to bring it within our reach that if we try a little harder, if we stoop a little lower, if we do a little better, we may get through. Jesus is saying you'll never get through. There's another way they try to get around this. It's an interesting one. The word camel is the Greek word kamelon. If you change one letter, there's another word that means rope or cable. And say, so, ah, uh, it's, it's kind of a misprint. What Jesus was actually saying was it's harder to get a, a rope through the eye of a needle. That makes more sense, doesn't it? Thread instead of rope. And so, again, what they're trying to say is it's really hard. They're trying to lower the severity of it. The problem is Matthew, Mark, and Luke all use the word camel. It's not a misprint. Every text we have says camel. That's what he said. A camel moving through the eye of a needle. Passing a rope through the eye of a needle would be impossible anyway, by the way. But they're trying to lower it. Jesus was lifting the hyperbole to its highest to show the impossibility of a rich person ever being saved. Jesus actually loved to use hyperbole, didn't he? He did it a lot. Remember that time he said, Listen, you're trying to pick the splinter out of somebody's eye. He said, why don't you remove the four by two in your own eye so that you can see properly to remove the splinter in theirs. It's hyperbole. Jesus using that. Another time, he needed an illustration of how much faith could move mountains. He said, if you find a mustard seed, smallest seed you'll ever find, a little mustard seed. He says, if you have faith that big, you can move mountains. See, hyperbole, going for the, the smallest thing in, in that case. Um, we read just a couple of weeks ago where Jesus said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. He's not telling people to maim themselves, but he's saying you have to take drastic action. I love this one. He, he said to the disciples, he said, to, to the religious people, he said, when people do things, you're always straining at gnats and swallowing camels. He loved good camel joke, didn't he, Jesus? He said, you're always straining at gnats, but you swallow camels. You, you go after every little thing in people's lives, but you, you yourself have got major problems. He loved to use hyperbole. Why did he use hyperbole so often? Because when you are talking about eternal things, the stakes are so high that we need to see the enormous difference between this life and the next. Between the natural man and our world and the infinitely more important spiritual man and the, and the realm we should be living for. There's a heaven and earth difference. Jesus said it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. But his camel illustration shows that the degree of difficulty is actually impossibility. That's what Jesus is saying. Hard to the point of being impossible. And so the disciples asked the natural question, who then can be saved? You see, they realized something by what Jesus just told them. They realized something. It's not just the rich that are chasing dollars and earthly security. 
those who are not rich usually want to be rich. And sometimes the love of money can actually distract a poor person as much as it distracts a rich person. They are spending their whole life saying, how do I get out of my lot in life to become like those wealthy people I see who seem to have it all together and have the life that I want to live? I want to tell you, the love of money is not confined to the rich. Everybody gets caught up with this. And in our part of the world, at this time in history, it seems to be the reigning God above everything. Possessions, material things, money. So the disciples are right. Who then can be saved? Notice that Jesus has already given them the answer. In the words that we've read this morning, he's already given them the answer because he addresses them like this. In verse 24, he says, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. He he addresses them as children. It's a term of affection. This is the only time that Jesus ever addressed the disciples as children in the synoptic gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, in John, he, we see a couple of times where he addresses the disciples as children. But in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this is the only time he calls them children. It's as if he's doing it on purpose, right? Why? Because he's drawing them back to where this whole conversation had begun before the rich young ruler even turned up. We were there a couple of weeks ago. Jesus had said with a little child, he said, listen, unless you become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. At that moment, when the disciples must have been questioning their own salvation, how can anyone be saved? Jesus addresses them with this beautiful word of assurance. Children, you are mine. You have received the kingdom, but because you came as children. You came to receive and not to do and to create it yourself. You've received it as a gift. You are children of the house because you came depending upon me. So the first thing in this passage is man's problem. Here's your problem this morning. Salvation is impossible. Impossible. But it quickly brings us to number two, God's power. Because here's the good news this morning. Impossibilities are his specialty. Impossibilities are God's specialty. Verse 26, and they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible. Men are never going to be able to save themselves. It'll never happen. With men, and he doesn't say rich men or poor men, he just says, with people. It is impossible, this salvation, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. That's a good word, isn't it? Thank God for that. With him, all things are possible. The translators, I believe, should have put an exclamation point right after that statement. When he says, with men, it is impossible. Should have had an exclamation point right there before he went any further. Because it is an absolute declaration. With men, it is impossible. And with Jesus' words, the last door of hope from man's side of the equation is sealed shut forever. These words of Jesus are the death knell of mere religion and morality as having any hope of saving us. With men, it is impossible. Impossible. Jesus' word. Impossible. Man himself can do absolutely nothing by any power of his own toward his salvation. Listen to this verse. This is way back in the Old Testament in the book of Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 23. And it might sound a little not very politically correct today. But it's, it's just a statement that gives you a picture. He says, can the Ethiopian change his skin? 
or the leopard its spots? Can a person who was born with very dark skin change that and take on a different skin color? Can the leopard stop being patterned the way he is? If that were possible, then you also can do good who are accustomed to doing evil. What is it talking about? The very nature of human beings. We are so stained by our sin. We're so lost in our sin. We can never change that. Sin is our very nature. It taints everything in us. All of our actions, all of our words, listen, listen. Even our motivations are tainted by sin. When we try to come to God, we come with ulterior motives. We are completely lost. How can we ever come to God when our best efforts that we try to dress ourselves up in are in his estimation, filthy rags like those of a beggar. And we're trying to impress God. And here he is, surrounded by the courts and the glory of heaven, and we're coming to him in in pauper's rags and trying to impress him. From a human perspective, from our side of the equation, the criteria for salvation can never be met. It is totally beyond our grasp. But God's ability is not limited as we are. And here is the good news this morning. God not only can make a way, God has made a way. God has made a way. By the offering up of his own son, sinless and perfect, to die in our place, to take the penalty of our sins, he was able to forgive us and cleanse us. And by his own power, which is matchless, there is nothing like his power on earth. I don't care how many nuclear weapons you have in your arsenal, there's nothing like God's power. And God comes into a person's life and all of that power is available to raise them to a new life. With men, it's impossible to change a thing, but God can change it all. With God, it is possible. That is the good news. When we don't trust in ourselves, but we trust in him and his way, all things are possible. Listen to me this morning, whoever you are, as bad as you are, as aware, as conscious of your sin as you are, It is possible that God can save you. It is possible that God will give you a new life. You are not beyond God's reach. You are beyond your own abilities. Face it. You are beyond your own abilities. You are beyond other men's abilities. I don't care if you call him pastor, priest, or pope. I don't care what rank he has or what clothes he wears. There's not a man on earth that can save you. There's not a person on earth that can do this for you, but God can do it for you. God is totally separate from all of that. And and haven't haven't we seen this? God work where men have given up. You know, I've, I've got to be honest with you this morning because I'm far from a perfect person. And there are people over the last 30 odd years of ministry, there are people that I have looked at and said... No way. There's no way they could be saved. There's no way. That's just too big an ask. It's impossible that they could ever. They're so lost. And and I've, in my heart, given up on certain people. Absolutely given up. No way they're ever going to change. But God saved them anyway. I give you their names. God saved them anyway in spite of the fact that I had really committed them and condemned them as impossibilities, God has so many glorious trophies of grace. There's going to be rapists and murderers and, and the most vile people in heaven because God saved them, because God is able. But here's the thing. Not one of them saved themselves. Don't you believe it? And we will be hearing about it for all of eternity. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me because not one of them could ever save themselves. Here's the thing. And this is Jesus' message. The more 
that hope in ourselves dies, the more our hope in God and in his grace rises like the morning sun. You have to come to the end of yourself and say, it'll never happen. Now, a person may be real quick and come to that conclusion within hours or days. Others, it takes a lifetime of failure to realize I'm never going to save myself. But this is the point we have to come to. And when finally hope of our own salvation dies, then hope in God and his grace can rise. The salvation of the rich is always a miracle. There's no other way. But that's true of any person, any man, any woman, rich or poor, greatly educated or very lowly educated. This is the same with us all. Salvation is always a miracle. But miracles are God's specialty. He's the one who spoke the worlds into being. With the word of his mouth, he made planets spin in perfect precision. Nothing is impossible with him. When, when sin had so overtaken the world that violence was on every hand, then how was it ever going to be stopped? How was it going to be eradicated? God submerged the entire planet underwater and brought through a people for himself. When the... When the People of Israel were up against the Red Sea and they were in a cul-de-sac with Pharaoh and his armies bearing down upon them so that there was no chance of escape. God made a way of escape. He just opened the waters like walls beside them. They went across on a highway of dry ground and then he destroyed the enemy behind them. And then the greatest of all, when his son was lying cold stone dead on a slab in a tomb when it was airless when there was no way he'd been beaten he'd been crucified his heart had stopped he was dead pronounced dead he was put there three days later up from the grave he arose by the power of God because nothing is impossible with God listen you say impossible and God says good let's get started because nothing is ever impossible with him. Man's problem, salvation is impossible from our side. Absolutely impossible. But God's power, impossibilities are his specialty. Number three, life's paradox. And the paradox is this. Jesus tells us here, give up all and gain everything. Yeah, that's counterintuitive to everything we were ever told growing up, wasn't it? Put money in your 401k every single week of your life. Make sure that you amass. Make sure you've got enough for a rainy day. Put 10% in an account. Make sure that, you, that you're saving. Do better than that. Build bigger businesses. Make bigger barns. Do whatever you can, but don't be left without. You've got to gain for yourself. Otherwise, you may end up without security. And Jesus says, give it all away and you will gain everything. But you try to hold it, you will lose everything. Look at verse 28. Then Peter began to say to Jesus, See, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now... In this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So Peter comes to Jesus and what does he do? He contrasts himself and the other disciples, the 12 of them, he contrasts them with that rich young ruler. Because that rich young ruler went away sorrowful. The price was too great. He didn't want to part with his riches. Peter steps up and he says, I don't know how anyone can be saved. Jesus said, with God it's possible. And Peter says, well, Lord, we have left everything. We have left everything behind to follow you. We didn't walk away sorrowful. We came after you. They have left earthly security behind to follow Jesus. They left their nets, those fishermen, 
The tax collectors left their tables. They left their livelihood. They left their homes. They left their family to follow Jesus. Now, be very careful. Because we could easily turn that into works, couldn't we? We could easily take, turn that into, well, if you give away enough and take a vow of poverty, God will save you on that basis. I told you, that's not how it's done. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that is, in view of the mercies of God, he has just spent 11 chapters telling them about God's plan of salvation and how God has given them everything as a free gift. And he says, I, I'm, I appeal to you on that basis. I beseech you on, in view of the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, right? In other words, do with your life what Abraham did with Isaac. Everything on the altar, ready to plunge in the knife. And you've and you got to be willing to put it all to death. You, you give it all up. You put it all on the altar. If you're going to sacrifice an animal in, in, in Old Testament times, you're losing the animal. It's gone. It's being slaughtered. He's saying, now you do that with your own life. It's going to die, all right? Which is your reasonable service. The writer, uh, but Paul, sorry, there, writing in Romans, is saying, when you've done all of that, don't think you've done anything. That's just how you must come to God. That's just the approach. You come to God and yourself and your ways and your thinking must die. You come as a child to receive the kingdom. And this is your reasonable service. Everything else is gone. You're not earning anything when you give up everything to follow Christ. You're not earning it's just the entry point that everyone else has to pass through. If you're going to trust Christ completely, everything else that you've trusted in has to go. There's only room for one on the throne. But it's still only Christ who saves you. It's not how much you've given up that saves you. Just giving up stuff and taking a vow of poverty doesn't do it. That would be works. Salvation may seem like it costs you everything, but you know what? God won't let it cost you anything. Because that's what Jesus said next. Yes, there seems to be a cost, but in the end, everything you lose is temporary. And God gives everything multiplied and running over and handed back again and again and again. I promise you this, God is no man's debtor. You lay down everything for God, you're going to find that in this paradox, everything is gained. But you've got to be careful how you interpret this. Because it's not a promise that if you become a Christian, God will make you wealthy here in this life. It's not. I know that Jesus says here, a uh, hundredfold now and in the life to come. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But this idea that if you Become a Christian, God is going to make you wealthy here. That is patently not true. Because listen, if the gospel isn't true for everyone, it's not true for anyone. And when my brothers and sisters are dying in prison cells in North Korea and China, for me to think that somehow my Christianity is more spiritual because I'm blessed is absolute nonsense. They're going through a great and difficult time. The Bible says here, God will give you with persecutions. Those people are not wealthy in the world's way of looking at it. And yet the promise has to be true for them as well. All through this story, as we've been reading it this week and last week, the emphasis is that real riches are not even to be found in this world and the things that it prizes. Jesus promises that there is a greater wealth given to believers, firstly, eternally. You, you'll, listen, one day, if you're a believer in Christ, you're going to come into an inheritance that would make Bill Gates look like a pauper. Eternity with God, right? So he's got all of that out there. But in this life also, Jesus says, what does that mean? Money and possessions mean nothing to God. In heaven, gold is road fill. 
Right? He paves the streets with that stuff. He doesn't care about money and possessions. That's not what's important. Here's the thing. God is going to give you in this life everything that you could ever need. You give up security, God will meet your every need. One way or another, every need will be met. You give up family, he'll give you his own family. I thank God that that he's speaking in spiritual terms. I've got friends who came out of the Muslim faith and when they did that, they lost their entire family for doing so. They lost their family because their family didn't want to have any more to do with them. They came to faith in Christ, but they will tell you today, their relationship with brothers and sisters in the family of God is closer and sweeter and more wonderful than anything they had before. Why? Because God is no man's debtor. We receive in this life and in the life to come. Jim Elliott, the great missionary to the Amazon jungle, wrote in his journal, he said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He gave up everything in the world's estimation. He was killed there in the Amazon, but he gained everything. No, Jesus says this. He says, you'll receive in this life and in the life to come a hundredfold with persecutions. Now, he's crystal clear about this not being an easy road to follow Christ. But I saw something this week I'd never really thought about before in this verse. Notice that persecutions is actually promised in the list of God's gifts. That perspective could change your thinking. That even The persecutions that we're required to go through are gifts for God to prove his faithfulness, his care, his grace, his mercy as we come through in his power. In the world's eyes, listen, the present condition of the rich young ruler is to be envied. He is clearly the success story. And everybody should emulate that young man. He's running in first place. He's a leader. But Jesus warns of the final reckoning, of ultimate realities. The disciples are not following the likes of the rich young ruler. And listen, those simple fishermen and tax collectors and publicans who Jesus called to follow him, those 12 men, their names are going to be on the foundations of God's city. You talk about reward. They are destined to sit upon 12 thrones beside Jesus. Jesus has prepared a place for each one of them. And when the rich young ruler dies, all of his possessions will be left behind. Everything gone. A person's material net worth in this life is no indicator of spiritual wealth or God's blessing. And if a person's riches become their focus, then it is nothing but a liability. I warn you to not become entangled with the stuff of this world. John wrote, he said, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, all these things are in the world. They are passing away. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning. If this morning God is speaking to your heart about where your focus has been, about the things that you've counted important, about things that may be a distraction to your spiritual growth and your following after Jesus, This morning, don't wait another hour. Don't wait for another Sunday message. Right now, lay it all down. Say, Jesus, it's you and nothing added to you. All of my hope and trust is in you alone as my Savior. Whatever you have to walk away from in this life, walk away. None of it's worth holding on to. Fix your eyes on Jesus. I promise you this. He is not a disappointment. In this life, he's never a disappointment. 
And when we step into eternity, following him will be the only thing that matters to us. If you're feeling God's challenge this morning, wherever you are, just raise your hand to dedicate everything in your life to Jesus Christ. That nothing will distract you. Just lift your hand up wherever you are. God bless you. Yes. And if you're watching us online today, wherever you are, pray with us this morning. Lay down everything that might distract you and follow after Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this challenging word this morning. We thank you that you hold nothing back, but you tell us the truth because only the truth can set us free. Lord, we, we proclaim today that you are our king and there is no other. That we follow after you and know that only in your blood can our sins be forgiven. Only in your power can our lives be lived in victory over sin. Only the Holy Spirit can change us to be like Jesus. Only you prepare a place for us in eternal life. Lord, we're hoping only in you. Lord, every person who's raised their hand this morning, who's raised their prayer to you, I pray, oh God, that it would be a real thing and that, Lord, it would be sealed in our hearts. Today we took another step to cast off every distraction, every hindrance, the things that so easily entangle us. We've put them aside that we might run with endurance the race that is set before us with Jesus At the finish line, our eyes fixed upon Him. And we know that He will bring us there for His glory and praise. Amen. Amen. Let's sing one last song of worship together. Would you stand with me this morning?
Hosanna, Savior. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Our only Savior, we thank you and praise you today. We so appreciate being with all of this wonderful family that you have created for us. Lord, thank you for your word that has spoken to us. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping you, which does not end in these moments. But Lord, we we carry this praise and worship out into the week ahead of us. We pray that we would live for your honor and glory and praise, that you would be exalted in all that we do and say, Lord, that you would change us more and more into the very image of Jesus by the work of your Holy Spirit and his power in us. And Lord, we pray that if you should not return this week, that the next time we see each other, we would do it with joy and with special fellowship and that you would continue to take us from glory to glory in your presence. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Thanks for being with us today. I want to remind you we have a prayer meeting tonight at 6 p.m. We'd love to see you there. Stay a little while and fellowship with each other. God bless you.